Now tonight we're continuing on a series entitled Finding Your Way Back to the Favor of God. Everybody say the favor of God. I don't know if you all understand this or not, but you're going to understand more as we go along in this series that even the Lord Jesus Christ himself as a man on this earth needed the favor of the Father. And I entitled this Returning, Finding Your Way Back to the Favor of the Father, to the Favor of God, because I want each and every one of you to understand that you'll never complete, you'll never fulfill your destiny without the favor of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself grew in favor with God and with man. As a man on this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ needed his Father's favor in order to do the will of the, the Father and to finish his destiny on this earth. So how much more do we need that favor? Now, I don't want to take the time to read it again because I've read it two weeks in a row now on part one and two, but let me just give you a little backdrop of Luke chapter 15 and what we know as the prodigal son. So Jesus said there was his father who had two sons. And the youngest one came to his father and he said, give me my inheritance. And the Bible says that he gave both of his sons, he divided to them their inheritance. Well, it wasn't long after that, the younger son, he decided he's going to leave home. And we don't know how long he was out there, but he was out in the world and wasted everything that he had on, you know, reckless living. He finally ran out of money, and on top of everything, there was a famine that hit the land. And the Bible says that he was so hungry that he begged a farmer for a job, and the farmer put him to work feeding the hogs. He hit rock bottom, folks. He was reduced to eating slop. He came to himself, and he said, you know what? He said, this is crazy. He says, here I am dying of hunger when my father has servants back at home that have plenty to eat and even left over. They have, you know, food to spare. He says, so here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my father, I've sinned, I'm nothing, I'm no good. Just let me be one of your servants. And the Bible says the father saw him coming from a way off, and the father began to rejoice. As a matter of fact, he was so excited, he said, you know, put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf. He threw a big party. Now, now the older son, he's out in the field working, he hears all the music and the dancing. So he asked somebody, what's all that about? And they said, well, haven't you heard your, your, your brother that has returned home? And the father, your father has threw a big party for him. Well, he got mad about it. Somebody told, told the dad, you know, he, he refuses to come in. He refuses to celebrate. So his father goes out and begins to plead with him, wants to know, why are you acting this way? And he said, Here's your son, the one that's been out there living with harlots and wasted all his money, been gone all this time. He said, he returns after making such a mess of his life. You throw a party for him. He said, on the other hand, he said, I've been right here the whole time. I've stayed with you. I've done everything you asked me to do. I've never disobeyed your commandments. And not once have you ever gave me the stuff that I needed or threw a big party for me. And his father just basically looks at him and says, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. Anytime you wanted to, you could have had a party. He said, basically, you didn't even have to ask. All you had to do was take advantage of what was yours all along. Now, how many of you remember when I started this series, I talked about the ability to choose one's attitude regardless of the circumstances. You have that freedom to choose your attitude regardless of the circumstances. Now, talking about favor, I want to say this. A lot of people don't know this, but favor and grace are the same thing. And we'll go in more detail on that along in the series, okay? But just for right now, if you was to go into your Bible and you would see in Genesis chapter 6, for example, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. A lot of translation says favor. You go to Genesis 39, 
the story of Joseph, where Joseph had been sold as a slave, and God blessed him so much, Potiphar looked at what was happening in his life, and he realized, the Bible says that he had grace, or he had favor, as some translation says, he had favor. God gave him favor with Potiphar, so much favor that Potiphar put him in charge of everything that he had. And no matter where he was at, it didn't matter whether he was in the pit or whether he was in the prison, and it led always to the palace, he always had favor. He needed the favor of God, the grace of God, in order to fulfill his destiny. I need it, you need it. There's a reason why more of God's children are not enjoying the favor of God. Now, I was talking about the attitude. You have a right to choose your attitude regardless of circumstances. Now, Webster was a Christian. In his 1828 dictionary, he defined attitude as posture, the position of things or persons in times of trouble. The position, the posture of people or things as in times of trouble. He went on to say it's a way of thinking or feeling that's reflected in a person's behavior. You can tell by the way a person is acting what kind of attitude they have. Amen? That's the reason parents say to their children, you better check that attitude at the door. Right? Because the way they're acting reflects something else going on up here. You see, it's the position of the body that implies a mental state. You talk to some people, they got their head down. That position of the body with the head down reflects something going on in their mind. That's the reason the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. John said in 3 John 2, he said, Beloved, he said, I wish above all things you would prosper and be in health even as. The Greek word translated even as means to the same degree or exactly in the same way, even as your soul prospers. The soul of man is not the part that was born again. It's the spirit of man that's born again. That's the reason Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. If you looked at it in the King James Bible, you will notice the first word, spirit, is capitalized and the second one is not. Basically, here's what Jesus was saying. That which is born by the Spirit of God is man's spirit. Our spirit's born again. So when John says, I, I want you to prosper and to be in health to the same degree that your soul prospers, he's basically talking about mind renewal, getting your mind renewed. You know, last week I made mention of the fact that Paul said he had the mind of Christ. And the word Christ means the anointed one, his anointing. So basically what Paul was saying was, he, my mind is anointed. What's it anointed with? It's anointed by the Holy Ghost. It's anointed by the Word of God. Oh, that we had more people with anointed minds. Hallelujah. Now, listen to me carefully. I want y'all to get this, okay? This is so important. I, I'm reminding you this because I want you to really pay special attention to the attitudes of these two brothers. Now, the younger one, first of all, in Luke 15, verse 19, when he came back home, he said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And I'm going to tell you right now, you may say, well, he was just being humble. That is false humility. There is a true humility and there is a false humility. Now, we've got to keep this thing balanced. We're not made righteous because of what we've done or who we are in ourselves. We've been made righteous by our faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all based on what he did for us, right? So don't get me wrong. The Bible says humble yourself. If you do, you'll be exalted in due time. But there's a false humility. And here's a man who comes back to his father and he says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Oh, just make me just one of your, your hired servants. 
And you're never going to enjoy the favor of God with that, that attitude. The word worthy comes from the Greek word axios, A-X-I-O-S, axios. It means deserving or one who has merited anything worthy. One who has merited. Most of the time, if you ask somebody who's been in church for very long at all, what is grace at face value, okay, at first sight, they'll say unmerited favor. That is true. What does unmerited mean? Y'all know why Boy Scouts give out merit badges? It's not because they deserve them, but it's because they earned them. To get that merit badge, you've got to work for it. You've got to uh, accomplish something. You've got to do something, right? So when we say that grace is unmerited favor, what we're basically saying is this is something that God gives us that we did not earn. We did not buy it. We could not be good enough. It was free just because he loves us and wants to bless us. Amen? Amen. Amen? It's no different than if you had a child who was acting like the fool. Listen to me carefully. Number one, you still love them unconditionally. No matter how bad their grades are, no matter how much trouble they get in, you love them unconditionally, right? And you want the best for them. That's our father. He wants the very best for each and every one of us. Yeah, but you know, so-and-so over here, you know, he, he just lives like the devil, you know. Well, I got news for y'all. If that person repents and it takes about that long to do it, God will bless them. Listen to me. I realize a lot of people, in spite of themselves, okay, they, they want the blessings of God. They want the good things that God has to offer. And a lot of times, as I showed you last week, they oppose themselves. In other words, they're actually the ones standing in the way from God being able to do what he wants to do in their life. Okay? But it doesn't change the way God feels about them. And I'm going to prove it to you in the word of God. So the younger son, now, because of his sins and his failures, he has the attitude that he's unworthy to be called a son. He hasn't earned the right to be called a son, right? Go with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and look with me in verse 12. John 1 in verse 12. John writes, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, that word power there comes from the Greek word exousia, and it means the right or the privilege. He gave them the right or the privilege to those that what? Believe on his name. He gave them that right, that privilege to become a son of God, even to them that believe on his name. He didn't say to them that worked for it, to those that were good enough, to those that earned it, right? As many as received him. Now, I want you all to get this. That word received there comes from the Greek word lambano, and it means to take or to get hold of. To take or to get hold of. So as many as took him or took hold of him, he gave them the right, the privilege to be called the son, become the son of God because they believe on his name. Paul used that same word in Philippians 3.12. In Philippians 3, verse 12, the King James says, I follow after that I may apprehend. Lambano is translated apprehend. I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The Amplified Classic brings it out very clearly. I press on to lay hold of, to grasp, make my own, that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me and made me his own. I'm laying hold of that for which I was laid hold of. He laid hold of me for a purpose. I'm laying hold of him for that same purpose because I want what he wants. I want his will, his perfect will to be done in my life. I want to be conformed into his image. I want to walk even as he walked. I want to experience his victory that he purchased 
through his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? Amen. He said, I got to lay hold of this. As a matter of fact, Paul uses it again in 1 Timothy 6, 12, when he says, lay hold of, lambano, lay hold of, take hold of eternal life. You have eternal life on the inside of you. Now take hold of it. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't let the devil kill you with sickness and disease in your body. Don't let the enemy tell you that you're just tired and worn out because you're over 60 years old now. How old am I? You know, I, you remember how old I am? How old am I, Wendell? I don't forget. 67? I'll be 68 in October. He'll be 69. The only thing good about turning 69 is he gets there before I do. Anyway. We are busier preaching the gospel and taking the gospel to the world now than we've ever been in our lives. God started dealing with me several years ago about taking hold of eternal life. By faith, lay hold of it. Fight the good fight of faith. Don't sit down and quit. Don't retire, refire. That life of God that's on the inside of your spirit you reach in with your faith and you release it into your body. You release it to your mind. You release it to your marriage and to your children, your grandchildren. You release it into your finances. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody say fight. fight. I'm not going to tell no fighting stories right now, <laughs> but I'm just telling you right now, a lot of people read that and they just started fighting their mother-in-law and their husband and their wife and everybody else. But he said, fight the good fight of faith. That's the only fight that we're called upon to fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say it out loud. By the blood of Jesus, Jesus, I have been made worthy. worthy. Now look, folks, this guy says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Well, see, he didn't know anything about grace. He didn't understand, according to Romans 5, 8. Watch this now. I want you all to see this, okay? Romans 5, 8 says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Everybody say, while I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. So he loved us so much that he gave his son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. Right? God's word translation says, Christ died for us while we were still sinners this demonstrates God's love for us. Verse 9 goes on to say, much more than. Everybody say, much more than. Much more than. Much more than. If he loved us so much that he would give his only begotten son to die for us while we were sinners, right? Yeah. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were sinners, enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Everybody say much more. Much more. Being reconciled, siled, we shall be saved by his life. The Amplified Classic says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it is much more certain now that we are reconciled that we shall be saved, daily delivered from sin to dominion through his resurrection life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, there are millions of Christians. I'm talking about a lot of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ today that have the same attitude that the younger son had. Younger signifying immaturity. Let me show you. Look at Galatians 4 verse 1. How many of you know the Bible tells us that in Romans 8, that if in verses 16 and 17, he says that if we are sons, then we are heirs. If you are a son or daughter of God because you've been born again, then you are an heir of God. And not only that, a joint heir. Romans 8, 17 says. Everybody say joint heir. Joint heir. With the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm an heir of God because I'm his son. Right? And that makes me a joint heir with Jesus, which means we share everything equally. According to Hebrews chapter 2, we have the same father as Jesus himself has. And he said, I'm not ashamed to call you my brothers. He is the elder brother. 
Galatians 1 says that the heir, everybody say, I'm an heir. The heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he's Lord of all. Though he's master of the entire estate, as long as he is a child, and that word child there is napios. Napios. Now listen to me carefully here, okay? Because I want y'all to understand something. Napios means a minor, one who is untaught, unskilled, and immature. I don't know if y'all understand this or not, but nepotism, nepotism has its benefits. You say, well, what is nepotism? That means that I just give you a job just because you're my child. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Nepotism has its benefits. Just because we're related, just because we have a relationship, you get special favor. Well, see, this younger son, he didn't understand this. He didn't understand that just because he was the father's son, he's going to get special treatment. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, if it had been one of the servants that had done that, ran off, and when he come back, his man would have probably told him, get out of my sight. But because it was one of his children, it was his son, he comes back, got his head down, you know, I'm just no good. I'm just a sorry, no good sinner, nothing but a worm in the dust. I'm not worthy to be called your son, you know. Just make me a servant. I like when I read to you last week from the Passion Translation, right in mid-sentence, the father just says, stop. No, I don't want to hear that. Throw a party. We're going to celebrate. Because my son... He was lost, now he's found. He's dead, but he's alive again. Hallelujah. He's back where he belongs. He's back in his place, in other words. Now, I want y'all to get this, okay? As long as the heir is immature, untaught, unskilled, in the word of righteousness, he's no different than a servant. And y'all know as well as I do, the servant... He doesn't inherit the things that a son does. You can be an heir of God, a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ, and still miss out on so much that belongs to you. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Now, remember the father said to him, the older son, all that I have is yours. Y'all remember that? Luke 15, 31. He said, all that I have is yours. Now, the older son, he's got a wrong attitude, too, and we're going to touch on this. Both sons had the wrong attitude. The younger one, he's got this unworthy attitude. You know, he's done gone out here, you know, got this seeking self-discovery thing going on. Got to find myself, you know, got to experience what's out there. That is nothing but thoughts from demons that makes people think that. Years ago, when I worked in General Motors, this guy that we had been, I had been witnessing to, I can't remember if I led him to the Lord or not, but he'd gotten saved. And they were doing pretty good for a while, but all of a sudden, he stops me as soon as I walk into the plant. Brother Eddie, I need you to pray for me. I said, what's going on? He said, my wife is, she's lost her mind. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, we got a child, and all of a sudden now, she's like, you know, we, we started dating in high school. You're the only guy that ever dated you know, I got married too young. I never, you know, experienced life. And now she's going out with her girlfriends to the clubs and, and the bars and all that stuff. Trying to find herself. But I'm going to tell you all something. If you really want to find your real true self that God created, you find it in Christ. Amen? Now watch this. The father told that older son, all that I have is yours. 1 Corinthians 3.21. I want to read the next three verses. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Paul was saying, 
It has nothing to do with whether you're listening to Paul or Peter or Apollos preach. These are nothing but ministers of the gospel. One plants the seed, another waters, but God gives the increase. And beside all of that, he says, here's what you need to understand. All things are already yours. You're not getting it from a man. God has already given you everything that you need in this life. Do y'all understand that everything you need was created from the foundation of the world for life and for godliness, the Bible says. Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth is Lord and the fullness thereof. Earlier I quoted Romans 8, 17. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Hebrews 1, verse 2 says that his son, he has appointed heir of all things. God appointed the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, as heir of all things. Heir of all things. And we're joint heirs with him. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 1. In Hebrews 11, 1, I think most of you are familiar with this. Now, faith is the substance of things. Everybody say things. Amen. Things hoped for. The evidence of things, say things, things, not seen. Now watch this. That word things comes from the Greek word pragma, P-R-A-G-M-A, pragma, which means a deed, that which has been accomplished, a thing that's already done, a fact, a concrete reality. That's the reason the Amplified Classic says that faith is the confirmation. It's the title deed. It's the proof, the conviction of their reality. Of all these things, if you have faith in God's promises, a promise was meant to be fulfilled. There's over 3,000 of them in the Bible. God gave promises, listen to me, with the intention that they be fulfilled, that they come to pass in our lives. But yet, they will not automatically come to pass. They have to be appropriated by faith. In other words, you take that scripture and you say, all things is mine. All things are mine in Christ Jesus. Everything Jesus accomplished was for us. Everything he obtained through his death, burial, and resurrection is ours simply because we are sons and daughters of God. Amen. Salvation, healing, deliverance, victory, peace, joy, prosperity, all of it belongs to us. Listen to me, the favor of God, if you're a child of God, the favor of God belongs to you, but you cannot claim something that you are ignorant of or unaware of. Now, it's a true story. I've told it before. I'm going to tell it again because it really bears repeating right here. Years ago, a very famous minister he had a great big church, and they built these homes for the elderly people in their city that had nowhere else to go to. And he would go out when he had opportunity and visit these people. One day, he walks in the home of an elderly lady living by herself in one of the homes that the church built. She's living in poverty. She's barely making it, you know, with the help of the church. So while he's visiting her, he sees a framed document on one of her walls. He walks over and looks at it. And he sees the name of a bank on it. And he asked the lady, he said, what is this document? And she said, I have no idea. He said, what do you mean? She said, well, I can't read. And he said, well, where did you get it? She said, well, I worked for a very wealthy man here in this city. The entire time his children were growing up, I lived in the home, took care of the family, raised the children, and on his deathbed, she said, I was like a family. I was just part of the family, the only family I had. And on his deathbed, he called me to this, his side and said, I want you to have this, and he gave it to me. She said it has great sentimental value. Well, folks, it had more than sentimental value. He said, can I have it examined? And she said, sure, but make sure you bring it back now. It means so much to me, you know. I have such great memories. Well, she didn't realize she had more than great memories. She was very wealthy, but she didn't know it. Because he took it to the bank and when he asked one of the officers to examine it, they said, we have been trying to find this woman for years and years. He left her a great inheritance. Here she is living in poverty, but yet all of it was hers. There are so many Christians that are living sick, diseased, 
They don't know that healing belongs to them. Look at your neighbor and say, healing belongs to you. Why do you think John would write, as an elderly man, that I wish or pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as to the degree that your soul, your mind prospers? Your souls, your mind, your will, your emotions. That's the reason James, he's writing to Christians because he says, my brethren, and he tells them to receive the word, the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. You've got to take the word of God, God's thoughts, God's anointed thoughts. You've got to engraft them with your thoughts to the point that they root out your thoughts and nothing left but an anointed mind. Hallelujah. About to make myself happy here. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to say this out loud. Faith begins, Faith begins where the will of God is known. God is known. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you the tale of two sisters. Sisters in the Lord, not biological, but sisters in the Lord. True story. Because it happened right here at this church many, many years ago. There was an elderly lady who loved God with all her heart, and she'd served the Lord ever since she was just a little girl. And now she's in her 80s, and she's in the hospital, and her health is deteriorating, getting worse and worse. And we loved her, and we prayed for her because she'd been such a, a precious saint to so many relatives, you know, and people, and one of the very first charter members of this church when it started way back yonder. But she's in the hospital, and she's in bad shape. Well, during that time, Another family started coming to church here and, uh, and still with us today. She had an incurable disease, and through the laying on of hands, she was instantly healed. I mean, she was dying. Y'all heard her testify. If it had not been that she came to this church when they did and got up under the word and started hearing about the healing power of God, she'd have been dead a long time ago because the doctors told her there's no cure for it. But she was instantly healed. So I go to the hospital to see the elderly lady. And she said, she always called me preacher. She said, preacher, she said, I want to ask you something. I said, yes, man, I knew, I knew, oh gosh. I could tell by the way she looked and the tone of her voice. She said, preacher, I want to ask you something. And I said, what is it? I said, what do you want to ask me? She said, I want to know why. She said, I have been serving God. And she told me, I forgot it was 70 something years or something like that. She said, I've been in church all my life. I've tithed, I've gave, I've worked, I've served, I've taught Sunday school, I have praised God, I've done everything I could to serve the Lord faithfully. And I said, well, yes, ma'am. She said, and I want to know why. That, that new woman just started coming, and she got instantly healed. I want to know why did God heal her and he won't heal me. And I had to explain to her. About, as I talked to y'all last week, about the different graces of God. There's a salvation that brings, uh, there's a grace that brings salvation. There's a grace of healing. There's a grace of giving. There's a lot of different, multifaceted graces of God, right? And I tried to explain to her, none of us deserve anything. See, what she thought was, because she had served God so faithfully in all these different ways, that she deserved to be healed. Folks, none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve to be healed, to be blessed, to have peace or joy and prosperity. We don't deserve it. There's a big difference in deserving something and being made worthy of it. See, the younger son told his father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And a lot of Christians today have adapted that same thinking. Well, I'm just not even worthy. Why would God do that for me? Why would God, how can I expect God to heal me, to bless me, to help me? I'm just so unworthy. No, you're not. Religion taught that. You hear what I'm saying? But see, the younger son, on one hand, he's trying to, you know, find himself and all that stuff. The older one, I mean, he was basically self-righteous. The older son, the older brother. Because he said, I've always been here with you. I've always done what you said. I've never disobeyed you. I've served you all these years. In other words, he was saying, I deserve. And the father said, listen, everything I have is yours. It was yours all the time. All you had to do is take advantage of what belonged to you already. 
Okay? Jesus has provided everything you would ever need. And all you got to do is take advantage of it. You say, well, how do I do that? You appropriate it with your faith. The just walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? The just walk by faith and not by sight. There, we, we are not governed by what we see, feel, hear, or the circumstances. We are to be governed by what we believe. Faith is of the heart. We believe what God says. Therefore, listen to me. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.13, he says, having the same spirit of faith as it is written. Now he's about to quote David. I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we speak. That's the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith believes what God says and says what God says and refuses to say anything else. Yeah, but you know what the doctor said. Yeah, but you know how hard it's been, what I've been going through. and Well, that's the problem. You've been going through it for the last 20 years. Instead of going through it, you're still stuck in it. Think it's not strange concerning the fire trials. Your faith is like gold tested in the fire. But you ought to come out to the other side shining brighter and brighter. Amen? Amen. Amen? You go through it with the right attitude, the attitude of faith. I told y'all last week, Job was written before Genesis. In my chronological Bible, Job's the first book in there. And we saw how that the stones, listen to me, he said, you're being in league, you'll have a covenant, you'll be in pact in agreement with the stones. I have no doubt whatsoever that David read that. So when he went out there and picked those stones up, he said, I'm in covenant with these stones. These stones don't have any choice but to help me and to serve me. Do y'all think really he was that good of a shot with a sling? I mean, we had sling shots when I was a boy. At least it had a fork, you know, and you pull it back, you can aim. That's not what their sling was like. They wrapped that stone in one end. They did let it right here. And when they released one end of it, that stone just took off. Goliath armor, folks, the only part of his body was not covered was one spot right there. One hole right there. And because David was in league with the stones, listen to me, that stone had no choice but to hit him right dead center where that hole was and dropped him just like that. Oh, if we could get people to walk by faith. God will move over a million people to get the one that has faith. Hallelujah. I want you to look with me in Romans 5, verse 1 and 2 for the Amplified Classic. Folks, you see, we haven't earned anything. That older son thought he had earned the right of access to his father's provision. He thought he had worked hard enough and served long enough that he had earned access to the provision of the father. But listen to this. Therefore, since we are justified, everybody say justified. You know what that means? It means just as if I'd never sinned. It means to be made righteous. That's the reason I want you to see this translation. Acquitted, declared righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous, Jesus said. I mean, John said. Paul said that God has made he who knew no sin to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you were born again, not only did you receive eternal life, but within that eternal life is the very righteousness of God himself. Yeah. It was imparted into your spirit. He says, and given a right standing with God. Through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, verse 2. Through him also, we have our access, entrance, introduction by faith into this grace, state of God's favor, in which we firmly and safely stand. Everybody say it out loud. I'm standing in the favor of God. Say it again. I'm standing. Right smack dab in the middle, right dab in the middle of, the of the favor of God. 
Say it out loud. The favor of God God. surrounds me, goes before me, follows me. I have favor everywhere I go, with every person I meet, in every situation that I'm in. I have the favor of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you go back and read that story in Luke 15, the younger son's language is so defeated. See, the devil wants you to be down on yourself. He wants you to have a poor self-image. He wants you to have a low self-esteem. And I told you before, I'm going to say it again. Both of those things are nothing but a result of a lack of knowledge. Through the prophet God said, Hosea 4, 6, he said, my people destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they don't know who they are. Listen to this. 1 John 3, 2 says, beloved, now, everybody say now. Now Now are we the sons of God. He didn't say, beloved, one day we're going to be the sons of God. Go to uh, 1 John 4 and let's begin reading in verse 14. I want to read down through 18. 1 John 4, 14. Man, there's some things in here that just blow your mind if you don't have the mind of Christ. And if you don't have the mind of Christ, that old mind needs to be blown. <laughs> right? Amen. He says, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he dwells in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. God in him herein is our love made ma- and made perfect. Everybody say perfect. perfect. The Greek word teleos, it which means complete. Herein is our love completed, made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Is John kidding us right here? Huh? That we can have boldness in the day of judgment? Boldness in the day that we stand before him, that we can stand there with boldness, with the right attitude, not a head all bent down like a dog with his tail between his legs. Right. Now watch now. He said if your love, if the love of God has made perfect, been complete, and have its perfect work in your life, he said you'll have boldness in the day of judgment because why? As he is. I bet there's not one, y'all ever heard of one percenters? I bet there's not one percent of the Christians in the entire world that sees themselves and believes that I am as he is right now in this world. That has nothing to do with your flesh. That has everything to do with the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ when you are born again and made a new creature in Christ. Because if you can see my spirit man standing here and my flesh man standing here, you would understand that this spirit man, he is righteous, he is holy, he is completely healed and whole and victorious in every way. He's never defeated, he's never depressed, he's never without. Then you look back over here at this flesh man and see people judge themselves on their conduct or their lack of conduct. Now here, stay, stay with me now. But you've got to become one of those people that judges yourself according to the word of God. Why do you think we're doing the series on Sunday morning called The Man in the Mirror? you got to look at the mirror of the word and see yourself the way that God sees you. Amen? Amen. Now he says, watch this, verse 18. There is no fear in love, no torment. Perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. The word fear actually means dread. Torment is referring to punishment. People who have not had the love of God perfected in their heart, they are in dread of being punished for something that they've done in this life. But I'm going to tell you right now, When God looks at you, he sees you in Christ. Like the hand in the glove, he sees the glove and not the hand. I am in Christ. Why do you think the Bible tells us in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation. Work it out. The Greek says work it out to this conclusion. You got to work it out. 
like a math problem on the board. You've got to work it to this end, to the conclusion, until you get it right. Yeah, there's going to be times when you fail a test. Yeah, there's going to be times when you mess up. You don't quit. You work it out until you get it right. Amen? Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now listen to me. The only way you're ever going to get rid of those thoughts of worthlessness, unworthy, shame, insecurity, is you're going to have to get a revelation of who you are in Christ. You know, people say, well, I'm just not good enough. Well, that's true. Neither am I or anybody else. He didn't save us because we were good enough. He saved us while we were yet sinners. Amen? See, that's just nothing but a lack of knowledge talking when people say things like that. What you ought to be saying, you ought to be out of bed every morning, and you ought to be saying, do it right now. I am, I am. who God says I am. God says I, have I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. I challenge you to make some notes and get up every morning and begin to say, I am who God says I am. I am in Christ Jesus. I have been created. I'm putting off the old man according to his former manner of life. I'm being renewed in the spirit of my mind, and I'm putting on the new man which after God is created and righteous as the true holy. I'm putting him on. I'm putting him on. If you look at it, if you look at it in the Greek, it's no different than, than just putting on this coat. Put it on. I'm putting it on. I don't have to wait for David to come put it on for me or my wife to put it on for me. I put it on. I put on the new man. I put him on by faith because I look in the mirror of the word and I see myself in the mirror of the word. And that man, that new man, that new creature in Christ, he's holy. He's righteous. He has victory. He has peace. He has joy. He's blessed and he's prosperous. Everything he put his hands to prospers. Amen? If you're taking notes, I want you to jot this down because you are highly favored of God. Do you hear me? God created man, and the Bible says in Psalms 8, 5, he crowned him with glory and honor. The word honor in Hebrew means splendor and majesty. Splendor and majesty. Y'all familiar with 2 Corinthians 5, 17? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, right? right? Listen to me. The life of God is a supernatural life. When you got born again, God didn't just enhance the life or the power that you already had on the inside of you. No, no, no. This is something brand new. This is something that never existed before. When you got born again, you began to live in the post-resurrection life of Christ, the post-resurrection life of Christ. If you read the, from the Amplified Classic in Philippians 3.10, Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Put that up in the Amplified Classic, everybody to see, please. Philippians 3.10. There's one part of it, especially, I want everybody to see right here. He says, and that I may, in that same way, come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection with it exerts over believers the power of that resurrection, the influence, the power that it has in a believer's life. This is post-resurrection life that we're living. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Yeah. Peculiar people. Amplified Classic says, God's own purchased special people. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a little bit special. <laughs> no, tell them you're a whole lot special. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen? See, religion doesn't teach that. Religion wants to keep people in their sinful state. Dwells on Romans 3.23. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. Matter of fact, they dwelt on the first half of that because they didn't have no clue as to what the second half was talking about. Coming short of the glory of God. They just dwelt on the all of sin part. We're all sinners. We all sin every day. That's not true. That is a lie. I'm telling you right now, 
There is no such thing as a saved sinner in the Bible. You will not find that person in the Bible. Oh, you can find people that are saved that did sin. I'm not saying you can't. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm about to you little children, that you sin not. Await your righteousness and sin not. I speak this to your shame. We've been made righteous, folks. Amen. Amen. Sin has no dominion over you. That means the devil can't make you sin. Nothing, no one can make you sin. Amen? Amen. See, Jesus came to redeem us, to wash us in his blood, right? right? To give us eternal life. To make us partakers of his nature. That's what Peter said. By these great and precious promises that God has given to us, he has made it so that we have now become partakers of the very nature of God. God is righteous. We have partook of that righteousness. God is holy. It is written, be ye holy, for he said, I am holy. And we've been created in his image in righteousness and true holiness. Do you see yourself that way? I'm telling y'all, I mean, I, matter of fact, I am challenging you. Get you a sticky pad and start writing things and put it on your mirror because you look at that mirror probably every day. At least once a day in the mornings, I hope you do anyway, before you walk outside. <laughs> and put little sticky notes in there. This is who I am in Christ. Yeah. Amen? I'm going to see myself and I'm going to remember all day long, this is who I am, the healed of the Lord, the blessed of the Lord. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Folks, we're part of a royal family. Now, I'm not talking about the natural. I'm talking about in the spirit realm, we have been made a part of a royal priesthood, a royal family. Your ancestry goes all the way back to God himself. Amen. I know a lot of you have done, you know, the DNA testing and hereditary stuff and all that. And I found out I had some stuff in me I'd never even heard of before. Idumean, a little bit, about 3%. But you know what's more important to me than any of that? My roots go all the way back to the God himself, the creator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's my father. Amen. Jesus is my elder brother, my Lord, my savior, my master. His blood flows in my veins. Amen. You might not be able to see it, but I'm wearing a crown of majesty. Crowned with glory and honor, splendor and majesty. Folks, we ought to be living like kings after all that Jesus did for us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm just telling you right now, other people might not be able to see that crown, but it's there. You may not be able to see it, but it's there. God sees it. Amen? Amen. Go back and read for yourself in Romans chapter 5, last part of the chapter where he tells us that through the gift of righteousness and grace that we reign in this life as a king through the one, yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. You see, many, many people will die, go to heaven, and there in the presence of God, they will realize I missed out on a lot of things while I was on earth because I believe religion instead of believing God's word. Let me tell y'all something about religion. I've got a couple more minutes here. Let me tell y'all something about religion. If you trace the religion to its root word, I believe it's Latin, it means bondage. It means bondage. Religion, religion puts people in bondage. That's the reason we got people in the world today that strap a bomb to themselves and walk in a crowd of people killing themselves along with many, many others. Religion puts them in bondage. You say, well, that's an extreme situation. It is. Here in America, we've got all kinds of different denominations of, of people, different religions, different beliefs. That puts people in all kinds of bondage as well. Right. Amen. I went to a church one time about 40, 45 years ago. I get there in the summertime they don't have air conditioner in the summertime in this building, and all the men's got long sleeve shirts on. 
But when I found out they had air, I wore a short sleeve shirt. I'm the only person there. I'm the only there with a short sleeve shirt. And they looking at me like I'm, you know, from a different planet or something. Then I come find out they got this crazy belief in their religion that men should wear long sleeve shirts. And that women should wear their hair long or in buns. I never figured out why you would have to have a woman wear her hair down to her waist, but then you put it on a bun, you know, in a bun on top of her head. Does that make any sense to y'all? And they got to have their dresses all the way down to the floor, and they couldn't wear makeup. They couldn't wear jewelry. I thought it was strange. You looked around, and some of the men had watches on, and the women couldn't have any jewelry of any kind. That's bondage. That's bondage. Amen. God doesn't want you to be in bondage. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. He's looking for people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. He wants you to have the freedom to reign as live as a king in this life. Hallelujah. Y'all do know that where the word of the king is, there's power, right? So everybody say, I'm a king. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings. Therefore, he's my king. But yet I am a king reigning under his authority, under his lordship, because of the gift of grace and righteousness. I choose this day to reign as a king in life. From this day forward, I refuse to allow the devil, anyone, or anything to put me in bondage again in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father God, I just praise you for your presence, for your power, for your word. And Lord, as I lift my hands over this congregation, I speak your blessings upon each and every one. I thank you, Father God, that anyone who confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be born again. I thank you, Father God, for your healing anointing, your power that is here and present to heal, to deliver, to set free right now. Oh, Father, you're so good. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, our King. With every head bowed, no one looking around. If you're here tonight, you say, I want to be saved. I need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. We're just going to let everybody pray together out loud. Or maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're watching the TV program. Just lift your hand and say, that's me. I want to see Christ as my Savior. Or you say, I've, I've drifted away from the Lord. I need to come back home like that prodigal son did long ago. And I'm not coming back with the attitude, Look, I'm just so unworthy. I'm coming back with the attitude, the blood of Jesus will make me worthy to stand in your presence and to receive everything that you have in store for me. If that's you, just lift your hand. Anybody at all. Those watching online, wherever you may be, you may be watching the TV program, just lift your hand and say, that's me. Now, if you would, pray this prayer out loud from your heart. Lord God, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. And this day, I confess him, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I receive you, Lord by grace through faith into my heart into my life I will never be the same in Jesus name Amen